Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is Chida Maslan, Lead Financial Officer uh, at the Government Data and Risk Management Group at the World Bank Treasury. Uh, welcome to our webinar on LIBOR transition for emerging market countries. What should public debt managers know about the new reference rates? Uh, we at the World Bank are delighted to welcome more than 100 debt management prof professionals from countries all over the world, as well as in international organizations and private sector representatives. <clears throat> of course, a special welcome to our presenters, Dan of Sinclair uh, from World Bank Treasury, and Celso Nozema, who is connected online uh, from International Finance Institute. Uh, so our webinar series has by now become an important cornerstone of our outreach program, and it is aimed at providing a platform for government debt managers to exchange their experiences, facilitate a peer-to-peer -peer network, and discuss the most topical issues. And I think this topic is uh, really a, a very relevant one. So LIBOR transition, uh, we are reading about it uh, in the newspapers every day. It's a very complex topic. So we just wanted to organize this session to provide some background, some update, uh, what we should know as debt managers uh, on the topic. Uh, as you know, since its inception in the mid-80s, the London Interbank Offered Rate, LIBOR, has been the dominant benchmark rate used around the world. And it is currently an interest rate benchmark that is used in transactions valued in trillions of dollars, in US dollars. Uh, but as we all know, of course, the LIBOR manipulation scandal in, the, in 2008 led the Financial Stability Board to recommend that alternative benchmark interest rates be developed for different currencies. And after 2021, banks will no longer be required to participate in the LIBOR rate setting process. So even though LIBOR is not being discontinued, in, in practice it will become unreliable uh, due to weaker participation in the fixing process and the markets move to other reference rates. So consequently, of course, financial markets are undergoing a significant re-engineering. And transition to this new benchmark uh, means different things for different uh, parts of the market. For debt managers, uh, that linked to LIBOR, uh, there will be a repricing of LIBOR-based contracts. Uh, the current variable rate debt index to LIBOR, EURIBOR, and similar reference rates might go some uh, repricing. It is uncertain how the new reference yield curves will evolve, making decision-making harder when considering issuing new floating rate debt. And when undertaking your debt management strategies, of course, um, you, you, need, you will need to take into account the new reference rates. Uh, and for countries that rely on derivatives for their risk management, LIBOR did provide a common standard across jurisdictions. Now, locally defined benchmarks might, might make FX risk management more complex. Uh, so we will also have a chance to discuss that. And operationally, uh, public debt management offices might have to adjust their information systems, financial reports, and or make changes in their legal agreements with lenders and counterparts. So what we really want today is to help you gain a better understanding of why LIBOR is being replaced, how market participants prepare for the 2021 deadline, and how in particular this transition might impact emerging market countries. So in this webinar, uh, Donald Sinclair, uh, from the World Bank Treasury will provide the background for the transition to the new benchmark rates, how it impacts the World Bank's uh, client, it might impact, as well as borrowing and investment operations. And Salso Nozema uh, from IAF will discuss the risk management point of view, providing the market's perspective. And I wanted to include a third speaker, uh, but it seems, you know, public debt managers are still uh, waiting to see, you know, waiting to, for the finalization of the regulatory uh, agreements, the work of the working groups, uh, you know, the perspective of the market. So it seems mm, there are not really too many countries who really started working uh, on this transition. Uh, as Amira said, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, so the agenda you see it uh, on the screen. Uh, and let me let me introduce Don. So Don is the head of the asset and liability management in the World Bank Treasury's Capital Markets Department. 
He manages the team that designs and executes risk management strategies for the World Bank's balance sheet and works with borrowing countries and clients to find market-based financial solutions. So all those big transactions, issues that the World Bank is doing, Don is the one who is spearheading the whole process. Um, the team's work also includes technical advisory engagements to aid in developing risk management capacity, and he represents IBRD and IDA on the Fed's Alternative Reference Rate Committee. Uh, Don joined the World Bank in 2008. He has expertise in market risk management, the fixed income, volatility, and derivatives markets, debt issues, and developing liability strategies. Prior to joining the bank, uh, Don spent 20 years in the private sector, developing funding programs and managing capital market strategies. So, without further ado, I pass the floor to Don. Thank Great. you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so, the, uh, the what I would like to talk about this morning is why um, why transition of LIBOR. Um, the, sort of talk about the differences between. Uh, LIBOR and some of the alternative rates that are uh, being uh, talked about and adopted, and then finally sort of go through um, a framework um, or an approach that uh, people can take to get ready for the transition. It's my, uh, you can yeah. use uh, this. There you go. Okay. Okay. So if the only if if, if, you, if you only walk away with five things. Today, these are the five things I really want you to, to know, and that is there is a need for planning for LIBOR transition because regulators have decided it is fundamentally flawed as a reference rate. What that means is LIBOR will go away. Um, the, uh, as we'll talk about, it doesn't necessarily mean we know exactly when it's going to go away, but it's going to go away so that you can't uh, stick your head in the sand and, and, and just hope LIBOR sticks around. Uh, secondly, there are differences in LIBOR and the selected alternative rates. Third, the financial instruments referencing um, uh, uh, the financial markets are adopting it, although it is fairly slow. Fourth, the transition to the alternative reference rates goes beyond just derivatives. Um, many cash products, including IBRD's own lending portfolio, actually reference LIBOR as well. And then finally, the transition requires a plan. So how did we get here? So LIBOR was uh, uh, started being used heavily in the derivatives markets in the early 90s. Um, it grew. Um, there, you know, at, the, at this point, there's um, well over 40, 400 trillion of transactions that reference LIBOR. Um, the mechanism for getting it to, to, to set is uh, a poll of dealers, asking them where they would lend to other dealers um, uh, on, on, on a term basis. Um, it uh, does not really, banks don't really act and operate that way, and so a lot of those rates are based more on expert judgment than market transactions. Uh, in 2008, there was a LIBOR manipulation scandal where some of these polling um, banks uh, colluded um, amongst themselves to, to edge the, the setting either a little bit higher or a little bit lower, um, which led for regulators um, to move in and really question use of LIBOR as a reference rate. Um, for uh, a number of years, uh, the regulators came out and suggested alternative rates. This was there was an urgency with that. When in 2017, the UK's Financial Conduct Authority uh, came out and said that no longer um, the banks will no longer have to participate in the LIBOR setting process after 2021, which means that. LIBOR could disappear as early as January of 2022. Um, there have been alternative reference rates to LIBOR um, set up uh, uh, in um, pretty much all the jurisdictions now. Um, your LIBOR is a little bit of an interesting case, but we'll talk about that um, in a minute. And then um, 
So that all really sort of leads to today, where we've got everything in place except for the actual transition, and that's why people need to start planning for that. So let's just talk a little bit more about when I'm talking about expert judgment. If you can on this, these graphs, you can see anything that's in gray there is where dealers um, were uh, guessing at what the rate was relative, ra rather than seeing actual market transactions between that two. And you can see when you get out to three months and six months and 12 months for all these things, it is predominantly a, a, a guess rather than an actual market transaction that's facing the setting. The um, uh, regulators like the Fed and the ECB and the Bank of England said it's not acceptable because that gray means that there could be collusion and manipulation in the setting. Um, and we need to find alternatives. So they did find alternatives. So these are five um, of the, uh, the, the, the alternatives that are there. Um, the market by far is mostly um, in U.S. dollars for LIBOR, but there are these other currencies as well. Um, so you've got the U.S. dollar LIBOR being replaced by what's known as the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, SOFR. Um, the, uh, it's based off of U.S. Treasury repo. You've got, um, in Europe, you've got uh, Ionia and Euribor. Um, actually, they're looking to reform the, um, uh, Euribor to have a new methodology that is less reliant on expert judgment. So your IBOR swaps may be around for a while, but um, there is uh, there is Euro LIBOR still out there, and that needs to be replaced. Also, there is um, uh, they've they've created a new um, risk-free rate called Ester, um, and and they're looking to re reform Euronia as well. Um, pound sterling, they uh, there was an existing. Sterling overnight index average outstanding. Um, they reformed that and have identified that as the pound sterling replacement. Um, the uh, Japanese markets, uh, three different benchmarks are going to really be replaced by the Tokyo overnight average rate. Um, and then uh, the Swiss markets have replaced it with the Swiss overnight average rate. Two things you should know about that is, is that LIBOR traditionally trades um, or is an unsecured rate, but the U.S. and the um, Swiss uh, alternative rate are actually collateralized, which means that there is a it takes the credit component out of the rate as well as as anything else. So, so that has to be dealt with. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what are the differences between alternative reference rates and LIBOR? Um, LIBOR doesn't have transparency as we talked about. Uh, the alternative reference rates are, are based primarily on market trade trades, and so it is much more readily transparent and the calculations are much more observable. Um, what that means is that since the underlying markets will have more volatility to them, um, the, the, these alternative reference rates are probably going to be somewhat more um, volatile as well. Um, trading volumes, unique market factors will all influence sort of that. We actually saw that this morning with the SOFA market where yesterday, well actually the last couple days, the U.S. repo market, which is the basis for the um, SOFA, the alternative um, for U.S. dollar LIBOR, um, has been very volatile and very dr technically driven. Um, and this morning, uh, SOFR set almost 300 basis points higher than yesterday's set, which is just um, actually since SOFR has been around the highest spike we've seen in SOFR. Um, and as I said, it's all driven by the fact that uh, the um, you, your IBOR, I'm sorry, your IBOR, um, LIBOR um, markets don't have that kind of volatility that the uh, SOFR does. Obviously, right now as we speak, um, LIBOR is still highly liquid. Um, there's still an awful lot of trades being done against LIBOR. 
um, the alternative reference rates are growing in liquidity, but it's still much lower, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, um, the uh, central theory is that this liquidity will trans will actually transfer from LIBOR to these alternative rates over some period of time. Um, we've got uh, an issue with the term structure. LIBOR offers overnight and one month and three month and six month terms so that you know that you can enter into a transaction and pay those, those short term rates um, for that, that full term. Um, right now, these alternative reference rates have no comparable. Everything is overnight. And so um, the market and many end users are waiting to see whether a term structure similar to LIBOR develops or whether they're going to have to, to, do, to, to look into other ways of um, um, being able to bill in advance and, and invest in advance and things like that. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that um, as the development goes on. And then, as I said, the credit risk, the dollar and the um, Swiss alternative rates, um, in addition, as you're thinking about trans, um, transitioning, you also need to be a credit adjustment to be able to, um, to, to, to make the transition. Um, just to give you a sense on the volumes that are going through the market, you can see um, uh, that uh, as of year to date, uh, 2019 through the end of the second quarter, uh, U.S. dollar LIBOR transactions were about $67 trillion. Um, those uh, related to the U.S. alternative were only $86 billion. So there's obviously a lot of market transition that has to be done. Even um, in the case of the pound um, LIBOR, the, um, where the, the alternative is actually much more established um, pound uh, LIBOR is still actually a greater portion of the market than, than not. So um, still room for financial instruments to start referencing it, for investors to start buying it, for, um, uh, for, uh, for, for new issuance to, to start um, using it. And so, what is the spread between LIBOR and the alternative reference rates? And this, this just actually talks about the um, dollar LIBOR versus um, SOFR. Um, you can see that, that the blue line there is six-month LIBOR, and you can see how much more volatile the SOFR, overnight SOFR rate is. Um, and then the... Uh, uh, the, the gray line there is the uh, uh, if you were using compounded uh, to, to come up with comparable. And you can see it sort of smooths out when you use compounding because you would never use an overnight rate really sort of as a one-day set. Um, but it still is, is more volatile in, in, in this. Um, just to, and it's also lower, as you would expect, because the SOFR rate is um, doesn't have the credit component or the term component, just sort of as a, a sense of what kind of adjustment we're really talking about here. Um, what has been done here is so far has only been officially around since April of 2018. So we've only got a little bit more than a year's worth of data. Uh, the, US, um, the New York Fed um, came up with a data history as part of testing and everything else that takes the SOFR history back to about 2014. And then beyond that, there's some proxies we can use. But using all those, you basically can see that depending on what period you use, um, the difference between three-month um, LIBOR and SOFR is going to be worth something like 20 to 35 basis points. The difference between, in other words, so for plus 25 to 35 basis points is equal to LIBOR. And then for six months, it's uh, something in the range of 40 to 50 basis points. So not huge, but not small either in terms of the adjustment that has to be made for, uh, for, 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 for equating LIBOR and SOFR. Um, so the last, the last bit here, I wanted to, to, to spend a little bit of time talking about 
sort of the trans, you know, how, how you used to think about a transition framework and considerations, and we'll share a little bit about what um, um, World Bank uh, is doing um, here. So you can sort of think about uh, a, a framework in three parts. One is you need to, to figure out how big a problem it is, and that's sort of done through doing an impact assessment. So you need to take a look at not only the financial products that you um, have using um, LIBOR, um, but you also have to look at contract language and you have to look at systems you use um, for valuation and models that you use for valuation and processing and things like that to sort of understand sort of really what is your LIBOR problem. Um, the World Bank has, has done this and it sort of looked at, it looked at not only sort of World Bank um, lends, borrows, and invests in, in LIBOR. And so we needed to go through and take a look at what are, the, what are the financial instruments we had. We needed to look at the contract language to see what happens if LIBOR goes away. And that's actually where a lot of the, the discussion goes right now because in the derivatives market, um, you have language that probably nev that never really expected LIBOR to go away. Um, for financial products, they either mirror that language or it doesn't say it at all. And so what happens when LIBOR goes away um, and you still have some of these financial products outstanding? So there's a lot of work uh, globally that's going on in terms of getting, getting that question answered. But in, in the, on top of just that's, that's more the, the financial impact, but then there's also people have systems to be able to reference it and know how to bill and know how to, to invest and things like that and, and value it. So that's I guess there. So once you have your impact assessment, you need to look at the implementation for getting yourself in a better position for it. So um, with the World Bank, we're using 20, the end of 2021 is the deadline. Don't know whether LIBOR will be around after that or not. We know that uh, dealers no longer have to participate in that, in the process of setting a LIBOR rate, but there are reasons that the dealers may um, participate for, for some period of time after they, they're required to. Um, and then, uh, but that, taking that as a, uh, the, the, the end point, then sort of work back in terms of what is the roadmap to get us to in the best possible position there. And, that, and, and many of that's going to depend on the first part in terms of what kind of problem do you have. If, uh, if you don't have a whole lot of problem with your, the instruments you're using in the contracts, then it may be just a systems and models issue. If, uh, if you don't have systems and models issues, maybe it's that. So it really will depend on the organization. Um, and if you're using outside managers for this stuff, you should be asking them also, what are they doing to prepare for LIBOR transition and things like that? Because their transition actually is your transition too, and you need to know that. And in terms of the, after you have this roadmap, then you need to build up a um, internal governance and communication plan. So uh, the governance usually is um, you know, sort of senior people within your organization to be able to make sure that you stay on, on task and you have the appropriate amount of sponsorship and urgency within your organization. Uh, and then so, um, no matter what is going on, you're going to need to be able to communicate your plan and objectives and everything else with all the uh, internal and external stakeholders um, of, of your organizations. Um, and this is probably the most difficult part because um, you'll find that your stakeholders have a, a wide degree of understanding about what's going on, what it may mean to them. Finally, just sort of taking a look at what the scope or well, actually, this, this is for what does the scope of the products, the contracts, I just talked about systems and that. Um, but that's just sort of gives you more in a different way of looking at. And then the, the elements of the roadmap that we're really sort of talking about. Your, um, your roadmap is going to be 
driven by the first three there. You, there are there are known industry milestones um, that you need to take into account. When is fiber potentially going away? What is um, uh, the group like ISA, which is uh, sort of drives or is basically of the energy um, driven markets? What are the milestones that they're looking for? What are trade groups like SIFMA and, and things like that doing about this? And what are their their deliverables? Um, you know, need to look at the internally driven assumptions. As I said, with the World Bank, one of the assumptions is that we need to be up and running on a new lending program, a new funding program, and a new investing program in 2021. So, um, so that sort of starts it. But then, what can we do? You know, the internal assumptions that. We'll, We've also made. We've made the assumption that um, LIBOR will still be around for the entire existence even before that. There still will be a, an active market up to that point, things like that. Um, and then you need to also prioritize your work streams, you know, what's on the critical path, what needs to be done first, and that kind of stuff. Those three things are going to drive your roadmap. You need to identify what are the transition risks and identify the risks to that roadmap that would make you want to change what your roadmap is um, and, and, and be able to um, react quickly as, as, as the transition risks may emerge. And then finally, you need to come up with a budget because none of this is going to be costless to your organizations. Uh, um, I or legal, um, you know, just the time, you know, the staff time spent looking at this and, and working at this all have their costs um, to your organization to, to develop a, a reasonable um, um, sort of budget so that you, you have the resources there to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that's it. I think that's what I wanted to share this morning. Stick around and be available for the Q&A after the uh, the other presentations. This is fascinating, huh? I don't know. Um, yeah, and what's interesting is that all those new reference rates have names similar to women's names. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was looking. So far, it looks like Sophie, Sophia, yeah. Esther, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Um, Okay, so we encourage you to keep submitting your questions, and now uh, we will pass the floor to Celso. Uh, but let me introduce Celso. Uh, Celso is currently a financial economist at the Institute of International Finance. He focuses on capital markets, infrastructure, and long-term investment trends. Uh, he is also responsible for developing new analytical tools to monitor financial risks across a range of classes in both mature and emerging markets. Um, prior to joining the IAS, uh, Celso served as Foreign Reserves Manager at the Central Bank of Brazil. And Celso has been writing uh, in the IAS uh, reports extensively on the issue of LIBOR transition. Uh, so thank you, Celso, for uh, agreeing to join our webinar today. Um, so the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Shudin, for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you. Uh, yeah, as you said, we, we've been publishing since 2017 when uh, it was announced that LIBOR will be seized uh, by the end of 2021. And initially, initially, the main concern was to design new, this new alternative rates. And we put a lot of efforts to, efforts to, to make sure our, our members uh, have have their voice heard and uh, the concerns about about what how the transition will be were were addressed and now what we've we've been focusing on is exactly the transition how instruments are are being implemented and whether we li liquidity in different markets are are being is being built so let me start by saying that this is supposed to be an improvement in the market so uh, the main concern is about our main concern is about the transition itself, 
And many times our members, they question whether, what is, what is the main bottleneck? And I think the answer for that is the great risk here is the degree of financial integration we have nowadays in global markets. So if uh, one segment is in the market is lagging, like all that will create ripple effects in every other sector. So it's less about whether you did your homework, but whether everyone else is on board for the transition. So uh, my first slide here is a brief introduction, but Don uh, brilliantly put all these this factors here. So let me skip for the fourth uh, bullet point here, uh, which is about the legacy uh, of LIBOR. And uh, only, uh, only about 20% of, of current contracts will, will mature after, after the, the cessation of LIBOR. So uh, most of these instruments, uh, they, they are not in the hands of sovereigns. They are mostly derivatives. And uh, I have I have one next slide here, which shows that this is so that instruments is only 1.1 trillion, about 1 trillion, uh, of of which only 37 billion are sovereign bonds, and uh, oh, the overall the overall the overall. Uh, the overall level of instruments tracking LIBOR past 2021 is 40 trillion. Uh, the, the picture is not particularly worrisome for public debt managers, as I said, uh, but if other issuers or bond buyers slack, that will create a period of reduced liquidity in bond market, potentially even triggering some selling. And I'll go back to this shortly. So next slide will show the activity on on sulfur linked bonds. And uh, here, Fannie Mae uh, and some other GSCs in the US, they have spearheaded this process. So, Fannie Mae, right after sulfur started to be published, they, they came up with, a, with a floating rate notes linked to sulfur. And what's interesting here for the man managers is that uh, they actually they didn't. Uh, they didn't swap back to LIBOR, so they, they kept the risk in their balance sheet on and in sulfur, and they they have been also swapping their fixed rate bonds to to sulfur derivatives. So they're they're feeling very comfortable holding uh, sulfur linked uh, uh, risk, and obviously that's not the same case for sovereigns because the functional currency for Fannie Mae is the U.S. dollar. But uh, it gives it, it gives a, a good sense of where the market is and how swap markets are developing uh, around these this instruments. Uh, so I want to go back to something that Don said about the important issues uh, across emerging markets and across financial institutions. First is the the fallback language. So here I would have advised that you take a look at the work from ARC in the US. They have, they have set a good uh, fallback language for contracts in many different financial instruments, namely uh, floating rate notes, uh, bilateral loans, uh, so on and so forth. And another issue for the market is the term structure, which is as, as the the new sulfur rate has an overnight uh, characteristic. It doesn't provide directly uh, a term a term rate for for uh, loans to be priced in. So what we we need here is more liquidity being built in futures and derivative markets, which which Fannie Mae set in the ground and some other followed. So we've been seeing like liquidity fastly developing there. So. Um, now I'll start to talk more about EM, concerns of, across EM countries. And uh, we used to see a big correlation between the, the credit spread, the, cre the credit spread of LIBOR, which is here we price against treasuries as the TED spread, and, uh, and the cost of financing for, for emerging markets. 
uh, what we've seen uh, more recently since LIBOR started to be more questioned is that this correlation is broken. So if in the past that was a good indication of how the market was seeing uh, emerging markets and the, their credit worthiness, uh, this connection is already broken. So this, this it's a good development because in a sense, the market has been already dealing with the, with, with the retirement of LIBOR for a while and this shows that it's not not even a good indicator for for overall credit risk uh, across the market. Um, from there, let's talk about what is being what is being done and what what is more specific to emerging markets. Let me skip to to some of the charts here. We have seen uh, a big increase in debt, uh, uh, U.S. denominated debt. And here is uh, one of the risks that emerging markets may be incurring in. And that doesn't, that, that's not only with the US dollars, but it's happening with the other hard currencies. US dollar is, uh, is, is the bulk of it. So you can see on, on the left, high, uh, left hand side, it's uh, how it's been increasing, especially in the last five years or so, we, we've been facing uh, really low rates uh, across developed countries. So that's a big incentive for emerging markets to come and be the U.S. market and, and other developed currencies. So on the right-hand side, we, we can see the same picture for EM governments. So you can see that uh, they, they've been increasing their reliance in US, uh, on, on the U.S. dollar. And that's where the risk for, for emerging markets is, is mounting. And the next slide show for, selected, for a selected uh, group of countries that this has been increasing to this, this, the lower rates in, in developed countries has been also increasing the foreign ownership of uh, local bonds. So remember that many times uh, bondholders, they, they swap their, their exposure back to wow. their, their functional currency. So that's, that's an indication of some risk there. And uh, if markets uh, for sulfur are not there for, for proper hedging, uh, you may see some drawdown of liquidity overall for the market. Okay, uh, second bullet point here is where we, we flag where, what are the points of attention for em emerging markets, right? And some of them I, I talked about already, so especially the, the high level of debt, but uh, some economies uh, are, are highly dollarized, if, if either officially or non-officially. So those may have even loans and uh, local loans uh, tracking LIBOR and uh, a high level of, of floating rate in the market too may be impacted. And there are, there are monetary policy practices that, that are linked to LIBOR too. So countries many times when, when they manage their reserves, they, they issue FX swaps. So there's a big uh, shakeup in FX swaps market. If I would advise that you see uh, some of, of the relevant links I added there about cross-currency uh, issues. Uh, the New York Fed made a great work. There's a paper called Interdealer Cross-Currency Swap Market Conventions. And it, it tries to address all the, all the discrepancies from, from adopting different markets, different currencies uh, in different jurisdictions. Um, there's also the problem of, of uh, weakening uh, next, next, net external positions. So if, if a country is re very reliant on exports or imports, uh, the, the amount of, of operations uh, in U.S. dollars and other, other affected currencies tends to be massive. Like one recent research uh, survey from the BIS shows that more than 80% of, of financial transactions globally are in uh, one of the five affected currencies. So this is a point of attention. Um, 
So as I said, uh, the transition is not uh, it uh, can be seen like with uh, every every market participant in isolation. What we have to see is like what what are the the uh, the risks of ripple effects across the market, and we've been we've been monitoring activity in uh, within the asset management community. Which is one of the point of attention for for the for UK FCA too. Uh, it seems they are being slower to to adopt the new reference rates, and since there are, there are important holders of VM debt, that may impact their demand once uh, the transition is completed or during the transition, if uh, the the right plan is not put in, set in place. Um, Another important aspect of it is that many times, especially money market funds operating in these markets, uh, they, are, they are benchmarked to LIBOR. So there's a whole process of spread adjustment and ISDA, here ISDA and uh, the BOJ has been uh, brilliant work on how to calculate this, this spread adjustment. But it tends to be a historical average of, of uh, uh, LIBOR versus SOFR or some other reference rate over time. And here my point is, as you can see in the chart, uh, this spread is not constant, right? So it, it varies with the level, so it has some correlation with the level too. So timing for, for the calculation of this spread is pretty, is pretty important. If, uh, if timing, if time for the transition is in a way that it's not representative of the underlying risk uh, priced by the credit spread between SOFR and LIBOR, the, this will change incentives for, for asset managers to hold uh, credit risk. So if, if uh, benchmark is set too low, they may not have incentives to, to, to hold riskier uh, bonds. Uh, once again, like ISDA has done a, a brilliant work on that, so I advise that you you take a look at the, at the options for the transition. And this has been already incorporated in fallback language for some of the some of the instruments that Arc is working on. Uh, here's another is another channel for spillovers that I would like to highlight. It's uh, we've been we've been very concerned on about corporates because they are lagging on on issuing that linked to 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 new new RF, RFRs. Uh, excuse me. Okay. Um, and here I just wa wanted to highlight that these may have may affect uh, budget offices too. So corporates, corporates will be impacted by hedging accounting, uh, fallback language, uh, the timeline of, non line of the transition. And for that, they need support from the official sector uh, in their ju jurisdictions as well. So many times, if you have an inter-company loan, uh, that, that may be linked to LIBOR, and uh, this, this has to be transitioned to a new, new reference rate. Uh, they will also be impacted with transfer pricing and funding if they have a, uh, if they have operations in in other jurisdictions. And the the positive point here is that many times the international EM companies they already operate in many many different jurisdictions, so they're already familiar with the process and the, with the difficulties found by by conciliating very different uh, approaches to, to borrowing rates. Uh, for me, for in, the, in Latin America, well, a good example is when you, when you have some operation involved in Mexico and Brazil, you have to, to deal with CETAs in Mexico and, and CELIC in Brazil, and they are not necessarily centralized or they, are, they don't necessarily track the same uh, credit worthiness. So it's a good example of how how EMs can can learn lessons from their own experiences in the past. Um, and here I would like to to just emphasize something that Don said before. It's uh, it's very important, and we've been emphasizing that in our research is that every every corporate or government run individualized ma mapping 
of of the of of their their exposure. So what Don called impact assessment. Uh, this can be what we can provide is the general lines of what what needs to be included in that assessment, uh, namely systems, products, models, contracts. But uh, every every single institution has to do their, their own homework. Um, here is just uh, the next two couple of slides, uh, two slides is, are just illustrations of uh, what's been happening in terms of financial integration and some of the potential links between the, the private sector and the, and the public sector. So you see the, the blue line there, uh, foreign banks issuing increasingly in US dollars for, for short-term uh, bonds, right? This is commercial papers actually. So you see, although you see some decrease in other sectors, foreign banks are increasingly financing their, their operations in, in foreign currency. So they have to, they also have to adjust. And uh, the, the second chart is uh, a, a bit of uh, more of a bit of more of the same in a way. It's, it just shows the, the amount of short term uh, financing needs. For, for selected countries. This is part of one of our, uh, our uh, more important indicators for how, how exposed one country may be uh, for the transition. And uh, with that, uh, I think I, I just added some relevant links that I mentioned in the presentation that, that I, I find useful to draw lessons and to, to understand what's going on in the, in the official sector too. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Shirin. I don't know if we should have open for questions. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, Salso. Uh, yes, let me quickly look at the uh, questions. Keep them coming. Uh, so maybe I will start with, uh, you know, a provocative question. Uh, for this library, there's been discussion about the Y2K kind of, you know, whether there will be some Big Bang Day in 2021. So, uh, will it be a Big Bang Day in 2021? That is a day when all at that time existing library linked debt and derivatives be converted to the new reference rate. And you did touch upon that, but uh, this is a question that came from uh, our participants. So maybe I can ask both to Don and uh, Celso. So the, the quick answer is no, not exactly the same way that that's meant because the, but there will be a day when um, the FCA, which is LIBOR's regulator, um, raises their hand and says LIBOR is no longer a valid reference rate, um, which, um, the work that is is doing in terms of coming up with a new definition of LIBOR um, would then trigger that LIBOR goes away for derivatives instruments. That does not necessarily mean that LIBOR does not continue to get published and things like that um, because cash products still need LIBOR um, and, and likely to. So it's not as clear as, I mean, you knew on the calendar when that was going to happen. This one, we don't know when it's going to happen. And we don't know um, um, exactly whether it will, be, it will cease for all instruments or just for certain instruments. And so, um, so I would say that there isn't going to be a big bang in the same way, but um, there will be some sort of a bang. It just may not be um, all at once. Um, in central clearing, they are actually looking for, which is the way derivatives um, are uh, sort of the care and feeding of derivatives from a, a, a holding perspective. They are looking to have, come up with what's virtually very close in terms of calendar, a big bang where they, they change the discounting to the new reference rates all at the same time. And that will have a big impact. Um, there'll be sort of a one-time sort of uh, uh, sort of adjustment to um, pricing and then move on from that. So. Yeah. Okay. Salsa, do you want to add? 
Yeah, um, if, if you want to raise awareness about the risks of the transition, uh, tendency is that, and officials have been talking about this, is that uh, we want to minimize the size of the cliff. Uh, honestly, I don't see it as a cliff. I see it as like a transition, transition steps that need to be taken. And I think uh, every, every one of the single steps, they, they have their own risks. So uh, I don't see I, I don't see I don't see uh, one day that is particularly important, but every single step al along the way, it's uh, it's it's a source of potential risk for the market. LIBOR, and at the same time, the fact that LIBOR will continue for a while with all the fallback um, language right in the contract. Uh, that hopefully there will be a smooth uh, transition. Okay, so by the way, there was a question about whether the presentations will be made available. Yes, as well as the recording uh, of this webinar will be made uh, publicly available. And also there was one question to Salso about the paper that you mentioned in your presentation. So we can provide the name of the paper later as well. Um, the other question is, it, it's very interesting to see that the, the new reference rates are more volatile uh, because they reflect those daily fluctuations. So they are more backward-looking reference rates from what I read. Well, uh, the, the reference rates themselves are overnight. Yes. And they're market-driven, which means that they have uh, technical factors that will drive them um, SOFR is probably the, the best example in the sense of we know at the end of every quarter and end of every year, there are technical factors that drive the repo rate in the U.S. higher. Um, it's basically just if, as you end up with the reporting periods, uh, banks need to do things on their balance sheet so that they get in when they go to the financial reporting, um, that's, but then they reverse themselves the, the, the few days afterwards. and so. If you look at the chart of just the overnight SOFR rate, it's going to, to, to spike every three months or so. Um, um, that's why you use compounded average for the period and that. So, so, so it's not only that it's an overnight rate, but it's also their technical factors that are driving the rate that aren't, aren't actually in existence for the live board market. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so this, this responded to the, so we had a question about what explains the high volatility and spread between LIBOR and the risk rate, reference, reference rate, basically what you responded. Um, so the other question I have, you, did, you both mentioned the budget perspective, right? Um, and so there will be, there's a budget to this the staff time, the systems, but also the difference between the uh, LIBOR and uh, the, these uh, new reference rates. So there might be need for a compensation, I understand, um, that will change hands between the lender and the uh, borrower. Uh, how would this compensation be calculated? Uh, who would have to pay? What would be a fair price for this compensation? Is I'm not sure what you mean by compensation. Uh, for the debt that, for the existing debt, for the debt that is uh, already in the portfolio of the government, for example, there will be a new uh, repricing. So, and there is a difference between the reference. Well, rates. I think the idea would be that if if you were converting from LIBOR to one of these alternative reference rates, an adjustment rather than a compensation would be mm -hmm. be made to make their equivalent. So. If you were LIBOR-based, um, you know that that, and you wanted to move it to SOFR, it'd be SOFR plus the spread is equal to LIBOR, and you would do it, mm -hmm. as, so that you would end up being an equivalence rather than a mm -hmm. compensation per mm -hmm. se. Um, that is actually the work that, um, for the legacy trades, that is this really um, working on and 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 and, and struggling with is sort of what is the mechanism to come up with that adjustment um, to be equivalent. Um, and in the case of the World Bank, that's also as we thinking about a new lending program, that is also the question of how do we um, sort of uh, uh, come up with what is the right way to think about the equivalence. I had that chart that sort of shows you historically what kind of spread that would be. 
but there's other ways of, of calculating and figuring out uh, that adjustment. Okay, let me quickly take a look. We do have a lot of questions coming up, so let me take a quick look. Um, yes. So, so one question is: Does this mean that we will have to amend all of our existing contracts with LIBOR? And how will the existing loans, bonds agreements be treated? With which? How will the agreements be treated? Uh, yeah, in terms of the yeah of the debt that will be paid out. So, yes, so the, the quick, the, 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 the quick, and probably not to be flip about it, it depends. You need to. This is part of the impact assessment that you look at to try to figure out what that means, because you'll have contract language. The um, the language that's in the derivatives market is different than the language that's in the mortgage-backed market, which is different than the language that's in mm -hmm. um, sort of the commercial lending market. That's different than it. It's like it. There, there's all different flavors and varieties of when it was done and what kind of instrument it is and things like that as to what all this means in terms of the transition. Um, and that's why you have to look at the con the, uh, um, your exposures on a contract basis, um, not only for figuring out what could happen, but you know potentially what you can do to mitigate the bad stuff that could happen. Um, the reality is derivatives are easy because they're sort of, in one way or another, bilateral contracts between two counterparts. The um, things like, uh, um, for instance, floating rate notes that are referencing to LIBOR are more difficult because, um, generally speaking, you have to actually get 100% agreement from all bondholders uh, for an issuer to change the contract language in a, in a floating rate note. Um, and the reality is, is that you know issuers may not know even who is holding their notes, and so it's almost a, an impossible thing for for them to, uh, to to change contract language and floating rate notes. And so, in those cases, you probably are going to live without whatever that language mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Council. Yes. Yeah, uh, I would like to add that uh, we've been seeing that uh, loans uh, instruments are the one lagging across across financial instruments. Uh, that's a problem. But on the other hand, I, I would advise there's a ARC has been doing great job on on designing fallback language specifically for bilateral loans and and syndicated loans. So there's a, there's a whole framework uh, put in place there that people can can uh, apply or or adjust to their own conditions. So this this is something I just wanted to highlight. Yeah, I I just to add a little bit to that. So the ARC work on the language is actually for new instruments that are referencing LIBOR, so you don't actually dig yourself a bigger hole. Um, when I was referring to, it was actually more, what do you do with your existing, existing. book? But yeah, so th maybe there is a follow-up question on that. For contracts with no fallback language, what recommended actions should sovereign debt managers take to mitigate against potential risks and uncertainties that may arise? Mm -hmm. That's a tough question. It, it is. I mean, the, the easiest question would be to sell sell the instrument. Um, um, mm -hmm. That would be one way to mitigate the risk. Um, or buy back. Or, 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 or buy. But that's not always a practical yeah. or reasonable mm -hmm. answer. Um, uh, there are, um, I guess it would really depend on what the instrument was mm -hmm. and sort of what how important it was to mm -hmm. the um, you know, to, to, to the overall portfolios that are being talked about, um, um, and or um, how comfortable the debt manager is in running a risk, right, a basis risk. So at the end of the day, um, the um, depending on the instrument, much of the fallback language would end up with a fixed rate at the last LIBOR set. Um, not all of them do that, but, but a lot of them do. And how comfortable you would you be in terms of moving your asset or your liability from floating rate to fixed rate at the then current market? Yeah. So, so do you have anything to add? I 
I think he's on mute. No, no. He's on. Sasso, can you hear us? Okay, maybe I will continue with the questions uh, while uh, Sasso is unmuting himself. So the other question was, Okay, so it's about what the World Bank recommends. I don't think we can recommend anything, but uh, what the World Bank recommends for governments to adopt, which rates, mm -hmm. and then whether the World Bank contracts would be adopt proper rates. So, I mean, we're not going to recommend any one rate. I mean, what we've shared with you here is the rates that the official sector, or in terms of regulators and the sort of these, these working groups, which tend to be banks, regulators, and uh, end users in some form, um, have identified as being the preferred alternative rate. Um, it's not the only alternative rate, but that's sort of where the, the market development and, uh, and, and efforts are going into. Um, so uh, there are LIBOR-based programs that have switched to things other than SOFR. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they won't switch to SOFR when SOFR is more liquid, but um, um, I think you just have to look and see what makes the most sense. Um, if you're trying to swap out of it, then you may want uh, where the, the development for derivatives are. If you don't care about swapping out of it, maybe there's other alternatives that make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, are you back, Salso? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Okay, so um, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. On, on that, I just wanted to to add that the uh, market was really uh, receptive for for the first issuance from Fannie Mae, as I mentioned, and the bit cover for now for floating rate notes uh, tracking so far have been uh, has been uh, very positive. So there's a market being built there, and I understand that there's a there's a first mover uh, disadvantage, but that's not the case anymore. Like there's already a market operating in uh, based on sulfur, so I think that's encouraging. Yeah, let me add a little bit to that. So Fannie Mae's issuance was out to about 18 months. Um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll toot our own horn um, from the World Bank perspective in the fact that we extended the curve once to two years for um, SOFR floaters, and then um, we extended it again just uh, about a few weeks ago out to five years for uh, SOFR floating rate notes. Mm -hmm. uh, the big difference between the volume that's primarily being done by the, uh, the U.S. GSEs and, um, and, and other issuers like the World Bank is that it's sort of hitting different sectors. So um, the, 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 the uh, US GSEs are hitting the money market um, investors, um, but what really needs to be done is, is for other investors to be pulled into the, uh, into the equation. And so what that requires is really sort of more, more um, maturity um, and, and also more options for them to do it. Uh, I mentioned that the World Bank is an investor in both in SOFR instruments. The reality is that we could invest more, but there aren't the assets outstanding to be able to do it. So we really just sort of need a broader range of issuers and investor types involved in the markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was also a question about who is responsible it is uh, for, from a government point of view, who is responsible it is to revise the contract. Uh, and I suppose it's a bilateral exercise, right? Uh, on the World Bank side, uh, probably the World Bank will disseminate the uh, knowledge to its lenders. Mm -hmm. On bilateral, it has to be a bilateral discussion um, between the government and the, and, and the lender. Yeah, so from, from a World Bank perspective, our lending is such that, um, you know, all our, our, all our lending is done um, under uh, loan general conditions. They basically, what are the terms of the loan? And so to amend it, you would have to go and you would have to um, sort of agree mutually that, that you want to make certain changes to the, to the language. Otherwise, the existing language stays um, 
uh, in effect and 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 and, uh, and governs the loan. So it's a very difficult exercise. Um, uh, invariably, somebody thinks that they're getting a better deal or a worse deal, and so it's a yeah. thing um, where we are in our process right now is we have uh, changed our general conditions for new loans, um, and we are um, sort of going through a process right now of education and discussion with our borrowers about this um, and seeing sort of where that process leads us in our discussions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Salso, on your side, um, do you have any anything to add to what, like, the World Bank perspective is one, but um, in terms of the rest of the market? Yeah, like, honestly, like, we, we don't, we don't, that's not our focus, so I, I'll just leave here. Yeah, okay. Okay, I, just maybe to add from my side, uh, you know, every country has to go through this exercise that Dan mentioned the impact assessment, starting with mapping the debt that is indexed to LIBOR, and then thinking about, uh, you know, based on that impact, uh, the multilaterals, most uh, most lenders, most, most responsible lenders will already have a plan in place, but then you, uh, every government, every public debt management official would have to really uh, look at, in detail, at all the um, creditors that are on, on its debt portfolio and have a plan for that, for that transition. Uh, maybe, Sal, so I have a question in terms of in general. Um, when I spoke with Sonia uh, the first time we were talking about this webinar, she did mention that sometimes you do receive questions uh, from your members regarding this library transition. So what kind of questions, like what kind of challenges you are facing regarding your um, members? Yeah, I, I think I think uh, what I mentioned before is one of the points, right? Like uh, many of the members, they they worry about they 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 tend to to think that they are doing their their part, they are doing their homework, but they they worry about uh, spillover effects across financial institutions. So if you don't, you, if you have a certain segment that's not let's say for some reason is not uh, utilizing uh, sulfur or new derivatives uh, tracking new reference rates, uh, that may have an impact on the products that they're selling or buying from that, that uh, counterparty. So they're, they're always uh, worried that we map where, where the laggards are and uh, what kind of measure they need to take to, to really get there. there. There are differences across jurisdictions and differences across sectors too, right? Like in, in the insurance sector, there are some, still some steps to take in terms of uh, asset liability management, uh, valuation and discounting rates for, for, for their liabilities. And uh, there, there are so, many, so many, many moving parts, and I think that's the main point, like having every, everybody on board is their, their main concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, by the way, there is also a question about whether there are some courses um, on this issue. I don't know whether IIF or the World Bank, like if people want to get more information about um, the progress on this library transition, are there trainings they could join? There are, not from the World Bank, um, although we are starting a communication process, I will say that the dealer community has has written and, 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 and has reached out extensively mm -hmm. on this. Um, so there may be something available through banking relationships. Um, in addition, um, sort of just the general, um, there's there's a whole cottage industry that's built up around this. That, that it also there's other things that are out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Salso, on your side, do you can you recommend any trainings that you know? Yeah, we we are holding a, an event in October during the annual meetings uh, with with Ark and Morgan Stanley. Uh, that's that's for members only. But if you if you are a member, you'll have access to to all the information, all the background of, and audio too it will be recorded. And we we tend to publish uh, frequently about this issue too. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, there is a question. I think we did answer. You both answered um, to some extent, but still I will uh, raise it. Are there any other alternatives apart from sulfur? And we heard that different countries have different reference rates. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for the U.S., I so, suppose. So, so, yeah. so I, I'm not quite sure I fully understand the question. In the U.S., the, there is SOFR, but there are other, other overnight and short-term mm -hmm. interest rates that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, development's not really being done in those markets. Um, you know, I think it is possible. So, for instance, there's the prime market. Um, there is, uh, you know, other sort of, sort of short rates. Um, in terms of... Um, other um, alternative rates across, it would be true also in terms of there's all these markets have got different things. It depends on what you want to do with it, what the investor demand is for it, where the market liquidity is, and things like that that, uh, that, that has to be looked at. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, it's a very deep topic and um, a lot of technical language that uh, we have to master as debt managers because usually for the public debt managers, um, it's floating rate debt, library based, uh, and we do work on, on that uh, when we work on our debt management strategies or when we borrow, but we don't really go into the nitty gritty. Uh, and some of the other topics that come to my mind, uh, beyond the central government portfolio, for example, all the public institutions that borrow, the state-owned enterprises, that the subnationals, uh, the government might have some contingent liabilities coming from the transition of those institutions into, um, into the new reference rates. So we could discuss this, but I don't see any more questions. Unless you have more questions, now is the time. We do have some a few minutes, about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, if you do have questions, please send them. Otherwise, we will close. And if the question comes after the session, you have my contact uh, as a host. Uh, you can send me your questions. I can address to the speakers individually. Yeah, by the way, I have a technical question. <laughs> Uh, because we call these risk-free reference rates as opposed to expert advice. So can you elaborate on that? I, um, I mean, is there more to it than, than just purely talking about risk-free rates? So the risk-free rate actually has to do with what are you using to discount your mm -hmm. the, for valuation mm -hmm. purposes mm -hmm. like that. And so um, and in the U.S. market, for instance, they were using they, – they, it used to be treasuries, and then they started using derivatives, um, and then in some form or another, and it, it sort of is now, you know, the Fed, I think rightly so, has is, is sort of said, you know what, that's not really the risk-free rate, right? There's a credit component exactly. to it that we want to get back out of it. Um, that doesn't mean it is. So it's, 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 you know, the way I think about it is you've got a reference rate. Um, that reference rate may or may not be the risk-free rate in the market. Um, mm -hmm. An example is... It looks like your IBOR is going to stick around. Your IBOR is not a risk-free rate. They're developing their own risk-free rate. They can use that to, to, to discount those cash flows back, um, but the reference rate is going to be based off of something that's not risk-free. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't get too hung up in the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. risk-free rate because not all these alternative rates are the risk-free rate. Exactly. So the literature talks a lot um, about risk-free rates, uh, and it might become a bit confusing. I mean, you would not to know all the details about it. Um, okay, we have another question. How great an IT challenge does the transition to risk-free rates present to market participants? And maybe both Salso and um, Don can answer. Right. Um, Salso, do you want to start? Um, there you go. Okay. So I'll talk about it from a, a World Bank perspective, and that is that the, um, the IT, 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 it is actually um, bigger than we expected it to be when we started going through it, because it's like the number of, um, you have sort of the, the systems which would actually um, uh, use it as, as a thing, but also models that use, use it in terms of and the difference being, being, being between the two is that one maybe use it for calculation 
and one may use it as a input and things like that. Um, is was was bigger than we expected it to be in terms of people using it for uh, loans and, and things like that, and also valuation versus you know sort of setting new rates and things like that. Um, it really depends in many ways about uh, how the, the the size of the problem depends how big is how big is your exposure and um, um, the um, um, uh, sort of how deep you know, you know, there's a valuation process mm -hmm. in there. Exactly, um, yeah. I think it's fair to say that it will impact something. I would also say that the ARC, um, among others, are really working to try to get vendors of financial platforms, that th things like Bloomberg and, and things like that, um, all on the same page and mm -hmm. all developing to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that potentially that will help ease some of the burden. But if you have a proprietary system that you're using, you very well may end up having to to uh, have a significant IT exercise. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so, can you repeat the question? Should, yes. should I, can you hear me? Yes. So the question is, how great an IT challenge does the transition to RFRs present to market participants? And Don gave the experience of the World Bank you can talk about the market participants, but also even in IAF, you have uh, extensive reporting done by IAF. So even for IAF, maybe you do have some IT challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think that's part of the impact assessment. And sorry if I'm repeating, Don, because I, I had some technical issues here. That's part of an impact assessment, right? It depends a lot on the complexity of your, your business line. So, so many many companies may be big users of uh, hedging instruments, and uh, all these moving parts like will will increase a lot the the, the challenge for IT. Uh, if you're if you're simply uh, an asset manager, I tend to think it's much easier to to deal with this with this uh, technical problems, and I think it's not not. Uh, that that difficult, but if you have so many operations and hedging instruments, and uh, you have a cash cash position to you, that that all complicates the 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 issue. Mm -hmm, exactly. And sorry, do you have something no. to add? Ah, okay. So, and I think for public debt managers, uh, the IT systems where uh, you record your debt, uh, so you would need a new reference, a new way of recording the floating rate debt. But also the models uh, around, uh, you know, the pricing uh, strategy, all of those would also have might have to be revised. Um, we have one more question. Yeah, should, sorry, shouldn't. Uh, let me yes. let me add something to. Um, I'm we we are we are talking a lot a lot about development in swaps market, and that's that's a big operational challenge to. If you're a debt manager, you're a heavy user of uh, swap instruments, and that that increases a lot the complexity. Yes, exactly. So this is the yes one of the biggest challenges is for uh, governments that use derivatives. Uh, this is where uh, we will see the biggest uh, challenge of you know, transition into the um, new reference rates. So. Um, well, this question has been answered, but still, uh, so the question is, what will the World Bank do with all the loans that adjust interest rate by LIBOR? And Don already mentioned, but yeah. I will let you. Yeah, repeat. I mean, our, lo our, our, our existing loans have um, contract language that talks about what happens if LIBOR goes mm -hmm. away, um, and um, without any other changes to that language, that's mm -hmm. what we would do. And Generally speaking, um, if LIBOR goes away, we end up um, management of the World Bank either picks a rate or suggests a rate to um, replace it. And, mm -hmm. and then depending on when the loan was, was you know, the loan contract language, um, you know, how that's taken up. So. Okay, perfect. I do think that we are coming to the end. Mm -hmm. Shall we close or? Yes, sure. Yes, I think we have closing close. remarks. Okay. Yes. So um, I will not try to uh, summarize 
all this discussion. Uh, but it was very interesting, uh, I think, for governments to think about what they will have to start thinking about uh, in terms of this transition to different reference rates, but also beyond the central government portfolio. Um, I think the governments also need to think about in terms of the fiscal risks that will come uh, from this transition. Uh, but now let's close. So what I will say is thank you very much for a lively participation and open discussion, uh, especially to Don and Celso for sharing your experiences and uh, putting significant effort to prepare these presentations. Uh, so Thank we you. always appreciate feedback uh, from our um, participants. So we will share a short uh, survey. We would appreciate if you could share your views, uh, topics that you would like to hear about. And also, if you are interested to deepen this discussion, of course, we are always available to answer questions for, uh, to follow up on some of the topics that we discussed today. We will keep you updated on our next webinar. I will give a chance to Don and, um, and Salso to thank, uh, to, to say, to close. Um, the only thing I would say is if you have questions, be happy to, uh, to, 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 to um, talk to you on a follow through. It's in, mm -hmm. it's in everybody's best interest that uh, people are thinking about this and, 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 and working towards, uh, towards uh, transition. Mm -hmm. Salso? Yeah, I just wanted to thank the, the opportunity, and yeah, I'm open for questions too if people have any follow-up question. Okay, and I would like to thank Amira, of course, who is always the one who makes sure these events happen smoothly. Uh, so I would like to thank you. Uh, good day and good night. <laughs>